guys can hear me all right? OK, good stuff. All right. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about the fabricless deployments for Whiskey apps. Uh, just a sort of a quick show of hands so that I know where, where everybody is. How many of you guys actually do DevOps? Oh, OK, good number of you. Uh, how many of you guys use uh, Fabric for deployments? OK. How about some uh, other tool like Ansible or Puppet? All right, OK. Good stuff. And finally, one last question, I promise. I'm not going to ask too many questions. Uh, how many of you guys actually enjoy the deployments that you do? Wow, OK. So there's like maybe three of you, three or four of you. OK, so hopefully uh, one of the things that you'll get from this talk is just uh, one way of approaching deployments so that they're a little bit more fun and a little less stressful. But let's start with a little bit of context. So uh, I'm a software engineer at, uh, at Points. And basically, I help build out the, uh, the next generation e-commerce platform for loyalty programs. Uh, and we're building this out all in uh, Python. And when it comes to loyalty programs, usually that means uh, sort of an easy, easier way of thinking of it is just basically the points that you would get from your retailer, from your airline, your hotel, things that you can basically buy, transfer, and use to upgrade your, your own customer experience. And the end result of that is uh, we try to make high quality loyalty programs and happily engage customers who actually want to use these, uh, these point systems. Uh, and as an engineer on working on this uh, platform, most of the software that we, we develop nowadays are actually Dockerized Flask microservices and a couple of web applications. Uh, we have maybe one or two Django apps, but mostly working with Flask and, and, and a lot of Docker. But that's not what I really wanted to talk about. So I'm a developer by day, but I'm a writer by night. It's actually my, my original passion. And so while I didn't end up going into journalism school or going in, took CS instead, I do enjoy blogging a lot. I enjoy blogging about code, about tech, um, specifically Python and Linux. Uh, it's a lot of fun. What I don't enjoy is maintaining this WordPress site that I use for my blog. Um, while WordPress is relatively easy to get set up initially, it becomes a hassle when you have yet another security update, uh, you try to work with some theming, or you try to extend it with some plugins. Um, not a, personally, not a huge fan of PHP. I know how to do it, but I'd rather not work with it. And so while I was dealing with one, yet another uh, upgrade for WordPress, I started thinking, well, I code in Python, and I blog. And, but the problem is that my blog doesn't run in Python. So why don't I write a blog web app in Python? I mean, how hard could it possibly be, right? Uh, turns out it's a, lot of, it's a lot of work. But nonetheless, uh, sort of persevered, and I basically have started a project called Rookeries. And it's essentially a blog CMS driven off of the database, written in Flask, and sort of using a modern uh, JavaScript uh, single page application UI. And one of the stated goals of my project is actually to make it easier to install than WordPress. And we'll just go over how the, the thinking behind that and how, uh, how, how the entire project has progressed so far. But before we continue, I just want to give a couple of disclaimers. Um, it's obvious probably for a lot of the more senior, senior devs in the crowd. But the setup that I'm going to talk about works for me. Like it works on, I don't want to say works on my machine, but it definitely works on my VPS. Uh, it may not work for you, especially if you, if you have a complex system. Um, also, I like using Ansible, but if you work in a team and you have an ops, ops team, they might have something to say about you just introducing Ansible randomly. Uh, do us all a favor. Don't annoy your ops team. They're working as hard as it is. Don't, you know, just don't do it. Unless you are the ops team, in which case, right. Um, and finally, one thing that I definitely want to stress is that 
the choices that you make for your technology stack, whether it be a deployment or your application, will definitely influence how you architect and how you deploy your application. So nothing is free. Everything, there are benefits and cons in, in each case. Uh, but OK, with, with, with that out of the way, I wanted to go over some of the sort of the principles that guided my thinking when developing this framework. So one of the first things that I wanted to expose is uh, basically using the, um, the 12 factor app guidelines. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with it, uh, but essentially it is uh, Heroku's take on building well-balanced, well-behaved cloud applications that are deployable essentially everywhere and anywhere. Uh, I highly recommend that link. Um, I don't have time to actually go through, through the details of it, but definitely, it de definitely helps make your applications much easier to deploy and much easier to work with. In the case of Rookeries, uh, 12, the 12-factor 12 app guidelines apply as in, I, I have basically declared all the dependencies that I have in my application, both uh, in Python and the JavaScript <laughs> dependencies, and the infrastructure dependencies, as you'll see. They're all declarative. You can basically, they're, it's very easy to reason about everything that needs to be put into place. Uh, it's all configurable via environment variables. Uh, that way I get to avoid a lot of the, the issues with managing different configuration files in different places. Um, obviously, you, your configuration can't be too complex, but it definitely solves a lot of problems. And I also wanted to make sure that whatever backing services, be they database or some other services, that I treat them as attached resources, that I can basically switch the attachment switch um, whether I'm going for a localized database or a remote database fairly easily just by changing out what is the connection string. And finally, and this has bitten me in the past where I've worked in places where the way you do things in development and the ways you deploy stuff in prod are very different. And so I wanted to have the same parity in terms of what is done in development and what is done in prod, both in the execution and in the deployment side of things. I also wanted to like make it declarative. Like I cannot harp on how much, how thinking about uh, things in a declarative fashion really helps. Because most of the time, as a developer, you're usually working on more high-end things rather than just low-level. Oh, push this thing into memory, pop it out. You are more trying to solve a business need or a personal need, and you should just be able to declare how you want your system to behave rather than explain to the system exactly what you want to do. And if you hear other talks like Gary Bernhardt's talks or uh, ones from Alan Kay, you'll, you'll find out that, yes, declarative code and systems are very much the future of computing. Well, they've kind of been since the 70s, but you know, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, in fact, if I may be so bold, I, I would say that Maybe it should be a, an addition to the Zen of Python, maybe? Like, declarative is better than procedural? I don't know, maybe? That would ring spell. I, never mind. I don't work in marketing, so it has. <laughs> uh, so, but when it comes to actually deploying web applications, um, why do we think that WordPress is easy to install? Well, we think it's easy to install because of the context of how we work with it. Most of the time, you're thinking of a of a traditional LAMP uh, server. So the way you would set that up, you obviously have, you have, you have Apache, ModPHP, and MySQL. You install your LAMP stack from your favorite vendor or whatever script you have. Uh, you unzip your application tarball. You configure Apache with ModPHP and point it at the app, which is a fun little exercise. Uh, configuration takes all, always takes longer than, than you think it does, especially with working with Apache settings. And you serve your app and you're done, right? How, how much harder, you know, should be fairly easy. Well, uh, that's all cool if you're using mod PHP and Apache. But if you want to use Nginx, suddenly you realize, huh, I don't have anything to actually serve my PHP code. I need an app server. So in reality, when you're actually deploying a, a web application, you actually think of it, you have to think of it in three tiers. You have your, your web server that manages the HTTP, HTTPS traffic. You have your application server that basically 
communicates with your web server and your web app to actually do anything useful. And then you have your web app talking to a database or whatever external service that they want, you want. And obviously, this is a simple application, right? If you're working in a, in a complex multi-application system, this just grows. There are more branches to this tree. And you can throw in load balancers and all that stuff. But that is the general thing that you, always, you, you have to do if you're deploying any web application. And if you look at uh, other technology stacks, you'll see that they are very, very similar in, in the way that they're set up. If you take something like Java, it becomes fairly obvious. You have Apache or Nginx, then you have an application server like Tomcat, Jetty or JBoss, and you have a package uh, in the form of a war or an ear file, which is essentially just a fancy archive with, with some configuration in it. And if you look at PHP, same thing. Apache Nginx, mod PHP, or fast CGI, something to run your PHP code, an archive of your code, and the configuration that goes with it. Python is no different. You, again, standard web server, mod whiskey, or you whiskey, G-Unicorn to actually act as the application server, the archive, and config. Okay, so now that we know what we're, what, what's our end goal and sort of our basic setup, how do we actually do it? So let's talk a little bit about my original setup. Uh, so my original setup was essentially, my development setup was a pre-provisioned uh, Vagrant box that I just had a bootstrap bash script that would do app get install, thing like that, one time install setup. My prod at that time was I, was I had a VPS with DreamHost, they had Apache, they had Fusion uh, Passenger, which is an uh, interesting little app server, and they had some old version of Python. I don't, think it was, I don't know if it was 2.5 or 2.6, uh, but you can see they're, they're very different. And I had Fabric running a bunch of shell scripts um, and touching a file, copying files over. <coughs> Only problem with the system, it's, it's not declarative. It, you can't run it multiple times. The, the dev stack and the prod tech stack are different. And it's not re reproducible. I can't just give you that my setup and expect you to be able to spin up like a Linode VPS with it. So I started to basically look at various provisioning technologies that I can use. I looked at SaltStack, I looked at Puppet. I set a load to Ansible because it was literally the easiest thing to set up, right? Just uh, pip install Ansible, app get inst Ansible, whichever one you want to work with. And so long as your guest machine and your host machine both have Python and both, ha both can communicate via SSH, you're done. You don't need any sort of um, agent or master node, master controls thing set up. And when it comes to actually declaring what you want to uh, have provisioned, all you have to do is supply a simple uh, playbook. So in this case, all that we're doing is we're telling um, Ansible to make sure that uh, Python dev and Python setup tools are available on the system. So if you need to, um, if it's not installed, it'll install it. If it is installed, it'll say great and go on uh, doing its other stuff. And running it's fairly simple. Uh, there's that little thing where you basically Ansible playbook, you specify your playbook YAML and uh, some other s s small minor stuff. Um, and you can do some pretty cool stuff with an Ansible playbook. It's not just a simple uh, specify a command or expect this particular state to be put in place. So here I am uh, essentially making sure that certain directories are set up in my, uh, in my uh, target VPS. And I want to make sure that they're, that they're present, that they have the right group, and that they have the right permissions. And as you can see here, I'm not doing it one line after another. I just have specified a list, and it's looping through that list, right, with the, with the items. Uh, these, these item things are just basically placeholders that, that get, uh, I guess, hydrated would be a good word for it, when Ansible goes through, through its checks. And you can get very fancy. Like, you can use, start using stuff like templates. So it has built-in support for Jinja. So here I have my Nginx configuration. This is actually an Nginx configuration that will work mostly. There, there's some sections that have been cut off. 
But this is how you would tell Nginx for this, for this particular host name and for this particular application, I want you to basically hand over all the traffic to UISGI. Um, and, and you could get very, very complicated with, uh, you could build some fair, fairly sophisticated uh, setups with, with just using this. And you can start doing stuff like including playbooks together, um, but there comes a time when you notice that you're repeating yourself when you're building various parts of your playbooks. And at that point, you have to refactor them into roles. We're just basically ways of organizing playbooks so that you can reuse templates, reuse variables. Um, there's a lot of good Ansible documentation on how to actually get the setup. Um, in the case of uh, Rookeries, I ended up actually creating two Ansible roles. One for the actual application, which is called Ansible-Rookeries, and one for the uh, Nginx UISGI supervisor infrastructure that I needed to actually run this, because I had another uh, Python application that was not Rookeries that I wanted to also run on the same server. Um, so I basically created these roles, and they're open source, they're uh, up on uh, Bitbucket, and the Engine U, U, sorry, Nginx UISGI supervisor role is available through uh, Ansible's Galaxy uh, site, which is kind of like a, a whole collection of various different uh, roles that you can plug, in, plug and play into your playbooks. So this is an example of how you would, you would basically grab my role and then inject it into your own playbook. As a result of going with Ansible, because originally I had that fabric set up, as you know. It turns out that Ansible handled all of the communication side of things. So I didn't have to need, I didn't need Fabric's SSH setup. Like I didn't, I no longer have to, had to actually connect to a server. I just had Ansible do, it, do that for me. But I still like to have this whole build system. Uh, so I started using a technology called Invoke. It's, it is actually, the core task runner for Fabric 2.0. So I didn't quite get rid, completely get rid of Fabric. I'm just using the parts of the new version just for, um, as a build system. And it's a little bit nicer to work with than, than Fabric itself. It's, it handles parameters a little bit better, a little bit more Unixy. y uh, Highly recommend it if you, if, you want, if you need a build system for your next Python project. Okay, so, uh, but let's talk about how how to deploy the, the Python Whiskey applications itself. So again, remember that uh, the web and app stack that I was talking about? I ended up using, like I said, Nginx and UWSGI. Uh, I found the uh, first time actually configuring Nginx. So I, at first I found it a little fiddly to work with, but just going with the default example for UWSGI works very well. And this is actually one of the configurations, uh, the ini files for a UWSGI process. And here I specify in the change dir, uh, directive which directory I want to change in, what virtual env I want to run my Python service in, and the module that I want, want it to run in on which, which socket. And you know how I wanted to go with the, uh, with the environment variables? Well, this is how you do it. You just basically specify env, and then you specify the name of your environment variable and the value. And that's not going to be an environment variable that's going to like litter your own bash console. This is just for the process that you're going to be running. So, and since we're using Jinja, I don't actually have to list out each, in, each uh, variable. I just have it iterate over a list, which is like brilliant. Um, in terms of actually controlling the services, uh, so contro controlling the web application, um, you supervise your D to stop and start and control the UISGI processes themselves. Um, I let Supervisor D also handle the logging of the application. You can configure um, UWSGI to do logging for you, but it's just simpler to tell Supervisor D, okay, have the UWSGI process logged to standard out and standard error, and Supervisor D will grab that, that log and basically send it to where, where it ought to go. One of the issues that I encountered is that you can't really use an old version of Supervisor D, you just run into issues. Going with something like three, version three and higher works. 
And part of the decision why I went with Supervisor D is that Ansible already had built-in support for, for working with Supervisor D, so it was kind of like a no-brainer. Uh, but this is one of those places where, yeah, the technology that you choose will dictate what you decide to do. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm just looking at the time. Okay, very quickly, when it comes to the packaging, the application, um, I went with the, the, the idea of archiving the Python code and the requirements, uploading, extracting them to a new folder remotely, uh, did uh, pip npn install, uh, changed the symlinks from the old one to the new one, and boom, you're done. Uh, I could have gone with uh, pip installing the application or with the Debian RPM installations, but it was a bit too much hassle. But I included a link if, you, if anybody actually wants to look into using uh, Debian packages as an installation mechanism. Finally, uh, just very quickly, uh, the measure of a good technology, I feel, is not only how easy it is to pick up and how flexible it is at the moment, but also how resilient it is to actually different changes that you, that you introduce into your application. Uh, in my case, I found that this setup actually works very well. It survived me changing application deployment strategy. So I was using the pip install setup earlier and it didn't quite work for me. But so I just changed it out and still most of the time everything worked. Um, I've my, for my front end, I migrated from using Bower to basically using a lot of NPM and Node.js. I migrated between databases. That, that wasn't a big, big issue. More surprisingly, it survived transitions through, through three different hosts. So I started off with DreamHost, uh, found them that they weren't as flexible as I want them to be. They're really good for PHP, but if you want to do stuff in Python using their VPS solution, it's, uh, it's a little icky. Um, so I ended up using a friend's VPS, uh, which was fine until my friend's VPS died. And yeah, my blog was on that, and that took months to recover. Uh, while Rookeries set up a, a new, new Linode system, new VPS, and in about like five, 10 minutes after running the script, I mean, I didn't have a lot of data to move over. That would have taken longer. But five, 10 minutes, and I was up and running. So since I work with Docker, you probably the first question is, why, dude, why aren't you using Docker? Well, I kind of, I know I'm going to go against the edge, the edge here, but I find that Docker is a, more of a container technology. It's, it's a good deployment target for, it's just another deployment target, honestly, when you think about it. Whether it's a container, a VM, a cloud instance, whatever it may be, you really need to have a good smooth deployment system, good provisioning system, regardless of what technology you end up using. And I personally, they're just from work experience, found that Docker does, or at least the microservices and Docker, introduce a lot of operational complexity that you don't think about until a little bit later. Some people use Docker as an, as, as an excuse to hide a messy setup. So you just basically, if, if I were using Docker with my original setup, I could just basically throw it all together and not worry about the, the icky edges of, of the system. But it's not, not really an excuse. You should have a good deployment story. And it sometimes encourages sort of like unsafe binary uh, blob uh, sysadmin pra practices. Like some people just download, do a Docker pull on a random package and, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're and, and just basically run it without actually uh, seeing, uh, making sure that everything is fine. Um, yeah, don't do that. Don't download random binaries off the internet and just run it with sudo, please don't. Anyways, for the future, of doc, uh, I'm going to add more documentation, decompose stuff, probably add SSL support, um, and a couple of other things. Thank you so very much uh, for your patience, and yes. Uh, if anybody's got questions for Dorian, uh, they could put their hands up. That way I can uh, come and run a mic over. Yeah. And the actual details about like, some of the setup, I've, I've put links. It's all in Bitbucket. So. Hi, um, we, we might have a very complex Ansible setup, but do you have any tips for testing and like making sure that the configuration you write is actually works and does what you want? Because we've had a lot of issues with silently failing or 
our, our syntax or, or the, the, the things we use in the YAML file, mm -hmm. not what they're looking for, and things just blowing up in our faces kind of thing? Well, in general, the, uh, my philosophy is that if, uh, if something works on a small scale, it'll often work on a big scale. So I would su suggest that, uh, so when I was actually developing this, uh, this role, these, these two roles, I actually tried to basically bu build out the entire system in, in Vagrant, first of all, and make sure that everything worked and worked smoothly, and I could just run the application completely off of a Vagrant box. Once I was happy with that, then I felt uh, reasonably secure that I could just point this at another system, another production, and, and go with it. So I, I would say, suggest just start small and try to build up from there and just iterate over the stuff. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Doesn't look like it. So everybody, please thank Dorian.